Broadcasting from the Andy Up Studio. It's the longest running poker podcast for the everyday poker player with your host, Joe Scales. Hello, A team. It's Friday, June 16th. As of last week, the Annie Up Poker Podcast has had over 550,000 listens combined, which is incredible. I would also ask that everyone give the show a review on whatever platform you listen. That'll help others find the show as well. Speaking of finding the show, if you haven't checked out the YouTube page, I would highly recommend doing that. Being able to follow along with the video on Hand of the Week or when I was talking to David Fishman, that's fun. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe because then you'll be notified when new videos come out. One last thing, a member of the A-Team, Paul Sussex, has created a documentary about underground poker in the UK. It was actually a pretty interesting watch. If you want to check that out, it's a short documentary called Raising the Stakes, Underground Poker in Essex, UK. That's all I really have, so let's get on with the show. Find out what conversations are happening around the poker table with Table Talk. All right. We are back around the poker table with Mike. Mike, hey, how the heck are you? Doing fairly well, Joe. Doing fairly well. How about you? Not bad at all. Oh, man. It's been a crazy week for me, just so you know. How's that? I just, uh, you know, table talk. I uh, talked around some tables and lost That's my money. <laughs> uh, I talk too I much or they talk too much and I listen too little or I'm not sure, but... Uh, yeah, I I was up. Uh, I took I took my money and put it in a. I went up and played a one-two game, and uh, within the first thirty minutes, I tripled my money. Tripled. That sounds like a good thing. Yeah, you know when I buy in, I buy in, you know, two three hundred at a time, mm-hmm. and I was sitting there going, "Oh my gosh, this is right dang on nice." So, uh, I uh, it's looking good. And commenced in the next two hours of watching it dwindle down to my final chip. And I just was all in for five. <laughs> <laughs> I had great hands. I really did. Uh, just they hit better. So, you know, what the heck. It happens. But, you know, yeah, it happens. I, I didn't get upset. I just uh, came home and went to bed and got up sulking. And that's that. <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not. But there's this poker tournament series going on right now in Vegas. Uh, You may have heard of it. It's called the World Series of Poker. Vegas. Is that (laughs) that in – that's out west somewhere, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I I may have heard of that before. (laughs) So there's actually – I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. A lot of players have won, you know, their second or their third or their fourth bracelets. But you have – Chad, uh, Chad Evesalage, I hope I said that right, but uh, he's won two bracelets already this summer, and we're early. Yeah. So hey, this is dang um, It's not even considered summer yet. Yeah. Now, we haven't even hit that hit the big date of that yet. Wow. Both of his bracelets were in uh, Dealer's Choice events. Okay. Um, which are fun. I I love those <laughs> kind of events, throwing in some mixed games, you know, but. He won the 10,000 event number 10. So it was the $10,000 dealer's choice six handed championship. And then the 1500 dealer's choice. So the, the cool thing about that is, I mean, those are way different fields, right? A $10,000 buy-in is a whole different player than what you're facing in the 1500. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was just looking back at things. You know the biggest payout so far in the World Series of Poker for the winner for the main event was Jamie Gold. For the main event? Yeah, Jamie Gold's win back in 2006, 12 million. Yeah. I'm looking at, they're saying that this year they're thinking about this uh, actually breaking that. Yeah. 
could be the first one. There's a lot of people that are thinking it could happen this year. Yeah. I think they may be right. I mean, if you look at the size of that field for the Gladiator, yep. now granted, we're talking about a $300 buy-in, yeah, right, sure. as opposed to 10000 10, But the size of the Gladiator was huge. Yeah. It was 23000 something, which is the only reason that – um, that Chad, who I was just talking about, Chad Eselodge, yep. it's the only reason he's not leading the player of the year race right now because the leader of the player of the year is Jason Simon, who won the Gladiator. So he got so many points how, for how that. How old is he? Do you know? Um, the youngest that I recall, and I think it is absolutely the youngest to win, was uh, Ariana Sanchez. At 19 years old, 19 and 8 months, and another winner was 19 and 10 months. Now you have to be 21, yeah. so that yeah, so now be one that will never be broken. Yep. That's, a, that's a record. It can't be beat right now. But, uh, I mean, there's a guy that won his first bracelet, um, Leon Strum. Mm -hmm. He won his first bracelet this year. He's only 22. Okay. There's some yeah. young folks out there, man, there. I don't know. They, they're really playing tough with their money, too. They, and it, sometimes it looks like it's reckless. And and I watch some of the clips and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I look at their eyes and things. And, no, it's, they're not playing reckless. They're, uh, it seems to me some of these guys really know what they're doing at that age. So, they Oh, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. and, you know, things like online poker. Mm-hmm that allows people to be able to get a little bit more of an education with that, play more hands and, and feel more comfortable and things back in the, back in the day that we were talking about with, with Doyle and, yeah. and yeah. Stu Unger and, and all of those guys, they had to be at a table playing. That's, there wasn't, there wasn't, you had to be looking eye to eye with these folks. That's my kind of poker. I think. But I am playing around online a little more than I used to, that's for sure. I mean, it's it's out there, so why not? Hey, I got called a donkey this weekend. Well, I mean... I threw I threw two hands away when I first got <laughs> it and just, just threw them away. Just, uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to stay with this and I'm going to stay with that. And then I'd fold on a, a turn or something. And that guy was smiling, called me a donkey. And the next hand, he I had to go rebuy. <laughs> and, and then uh, I didn't hear that from him again. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I just smiled, kept on playing. I didn't say a word. Just ask Patrick from Hand of the Week. Yep, that's it. Um, I understand. Don't poke the bear. Just don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. <laughs> don't poke the bear. I, I want to get through this Player of the Year because okay. there's there's that. a few players in there that. So Jason Simon, mm -hmm. he's leading still. But right on his tail is the Chad Ezelodge, who's won the two bracelets. Tyler Brown, kind of a ways back, but there's um, David ODB Baker. Uh, ODB. He's been around for a long time, and uh, so it's good to see him up there in that Player of the Year marker at, at this point. There's Nick Shulman in fifth, so that kind of rounds out that top five right now. I don't know. I'm looking right now to see where Josh REA is because he won a bracelet again this year. Looks like he's ninth. Yeah, so he won this year. He won the $10,000 Limit Hold'em event number 22. Wow. So he's got five bracelets now. You know, I was talking about this is a year where people are winning – more more and more bracelets. We got Josh Arias won his fifth. Sean Deeb's won his sixth. And we are still early. So more bracelets to be handed more out be for handed sure. Up. More to be handed up. We got to get down to our place very soon, the new one, because that's going to be a circuit event place. And they should be opening their doors uh, on the permanent one next year. Yep. So we definitely want to get down there before that. Yeah, we so. should get down there and at least see their the site that they've got set up now for the big tent, I call it. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all. You know, I don't have a whole lot right now. Uh, I do. I will say that I'm, I'm building on my studio out here. 
so that uh, it's a construction zone. That's why I'm sitting here in the dining room. <laughs> but I get this studio nice. finished up, and I think I'll have all my my, my stuff on there right, and it'll, it'll really be nice. And then I got to get you get me some signage to put up. <laughs> Good deal. All well, right, Mike, so appreciate you joining me another week, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll talk next week. It's always fun, man. Thank you. It's time for Call the Floor with Elliot Schechter. Elliot Schechter is the poker room manager for Rivers Casino in Schenectady, New York. He joins us each week to say how he would rule in situations that come up in your games. And he's back again with us this week. Elliot, how you doing? I'm doing well. Nice and refreshed. I'm relaxed. I'm recharged. So I'm raring to go. <laughs> you had a good, uh, relaxing week away from from Andy up, away from the poker room, away from uh, all of the situations that come up. Yep, didn't <laughs> didn't answer an email or a phone call. It was great. Nice. <laughs> well, sorry to bring you back to this, but we've got a couple of interesting ones that have been sent in in your absence. So this one that we're going to talk about today sent in by Frank Braden and he's playing in a tournament. It looks like blinds are 3000, 6,000 with a 6,000 big blind ante. Uh, the guy in the big blind loses a big pot when he gets all in post flop with aces against a flop set dealer does the counts and the guy with aces covers, but just barely. He has 2.3 thousand left, so 2,300 left. And he's all in on the small blind the following hand. Somehow the action folds all the way around to him, so he and the big blind flip over their hands and the dealer runs the board. The small blind wins. The dealer gives the small blind his blind 2,300 from the big blind stack and 6,000 from the ante. A floor man who was watching then intervened and says that the small blind is not eligible to win the 6K ante because he had less than 6,000 to start the hand and you can't win more than the total of your stack from any individual player. He goes on to explain that if each player had contributed 500 as an ante or whatever, the small blind would be able to win the antes. But as is, he can win a max of 2,300 total from the big blind, including his ante. A second foreman is called for a ruling, and he agrees. Was this correct? The answer is no. The dealer... <laughs> The first floor man, if you're listening, you're a dumbass. The second floor man, <laughs> if you're listening, you're a dumbass too. And now let me explain. The dealer had it correct. He had 23 up. He gets 23 from the blind. He gets the antis. It Obviously, from the way it's described, this is an anti-first uh, big blind house. Well, the ante is posted before any action is taken or declared. Well, the ante was out there, regardless of what anybody had in their stack at that point. He had 2,300. He gets 2,300 in action from any player active in the hand, which in that case was only the big blind. Oh, well, tough. That's the way it goes. And just because he can't win more than 2,300 or at the start of the hand only had 2,300, that ante is paid by every single player. And while it's only paid once around, it represents everybody putting up an ante every single hand. So right, right. if he was the small blind, by definition, he had the big blind the previous hand and paid his ante for the entire round. He was entitled to as much action as possible on that 2,300 he had left as he could possibly get. And that includes getting the whole 23 out of the big blind for winning the hand. So uh, the dealer had it right. The dealer did their job and then got overruled by a floor man who didn't know the rules and couldn't apply them correctly. <laughs> Yeah, that was my first thought was he had to put that in a hand earlier. Like, so he did put it in. He just didn't have to in that hand. He fulfilled his um, obligation to the table and to the game by making the ante's right. So he's entitled to 100% action 
on his chips the next hand, which the floor man and his co-floor man uh, prevented for no apparent reason. Which, uh, obviously, Frank knew something was amiss here as well. I mean, I feel like that's, as you said, <laughs> that, that's a pretty big mistake for a floor to to make because there are obviously a lot of people that, that knew this. The, the dealer knew it. Frank knew it. I, I don't know. He didn't say that the small blind made that much of a big deal, but I'm assuming he did if a second floor man was called. Um, well, obviously not enough of a deal because if, if I'm the poor guy in the small blind with this incredibly short stack, uh, you're not getting another handout until this is rectified. I am screaming. I'm yelling. I'm probably getting up on the chair, if not the table. I am not going to let anything happen other than uh, the man in charge get to the table and make the correct ruling. And this is a tough one for the other players because, let's face it, in tournament play, you need to outlast everybody else. Therefore, you need players to get eliminated. So sure. it's almost in nobody's interest for somebody to speak up correctly to get this big blind, to get this guy more chips. Uh, right. That's a tough spot. But the game depends on integrity. The game depends on people saying – uh, something when they see something. The game depends on everybody protecting uh, the general welfare and good of the players in the game. I mean, it is it is kind of a rough spot in that situation, but he uh, the small blind's he getting chips. The, the small blind's getting chips regardless, so it's not like he's knocked out on the hand. So it's not even that big of a deal for somebody to speak up. So if, if they knew the rule, then they should have been saying something for sure. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, this is the kind of spot. If I'm playing and I see this happen, I'm speaking up and, and rather loudly, just not letting it go. And I try not to, to do anything other than play anonymously. I, I, I tend to try to blend into the background. I don't want uh, people recognizing me and, all the time. I mean, I, getting the recognition is great, and it's nice to team. It's nice to uh, to talk with uh, with listeners and, and readers, and and I enjoy that, and I, I like giving feedback. But uh, generally, if I'm not too anonymous, I end up uh, doing Q and A sessions for the entire time I'm playing. <laughs> is generally not enjoyable. Yeah, that makes sense. But so let's take this a step further, though. What is the the next step. So if you've got two floormen there that have made the incorrect decision, what's the next step? That's for the tournament director. And if not that casino manager, uh, you got to get, you got to get the guy in charge. And obviously these supervisors, if they were the guy in charge, they're incompetent. If they're not the guy in charge, there's somebody they report to. That's the guy in charge. You got to get the next level. I don't advocate being a Karen and this is not being a Karen when when something egregious is about to happen, right? Uh, especially when you're looking out for somebody else, uh, you're protecting the entire game and the players at the table. Uh, you got to keep asking for the next level because this is not right. When we set down the rules for big blind Annie, we made it clear that the Annie was placed prior to any action period. And whatever residual chips are left over, those chips get action from any players in the pot. It, it's just that crystal clear. Uh, we couldn't yeah. make it any more simple for somebody to understand and for somebody to twist that and decide that, Oh, they can only get action on this, this much. That's not how this works. That that's, that's applying the wrong principle at the wrong time. That is the principle from individual Annie. If everybody put up Annie's, you would then have that money deducted and then whatever chips you'd have left over, you get action on. That's not how this works anymore. Right. right. So yeah, you, you got to keep asking for the next level. There's going to be somebody else in charge. Even at the World Series, there's five different levels of supervisor there. Eventually, yeah, you get to the top of the pyramid, and if you have to, you have to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I think the the biggest common sense part of it is, like we said, they had to pay that. They, it's not that they didn't pay it; they just paid it a hand earlier. Precisely. So, and yeah, you're not I, paying I, for the round you played; you're paying for the round you're about to play. Yeah. That's how the blinds are defined. Therefore, that's how the big blind ante is defined. So again, yeah, you don't play rent free for six hands or seven hands, and then all of a sudden pay fees for the previous. Uh, 
that's not how renting an apartment works. When you rent an apartment, you pay at the beginning of the month for the month you're living in it. You don't pay right. for the previous month that you already lived in it. You pay for the use of, not for the prior use of, for the right. future right. use of. Well, that's exactly how the principle is applied to Big Blind Annie. You're paying for the next round. Well, as we pointed out, he paid his obligation. He gets action right. on whatever he's got. It's completely yeah. unfair otherwise. And yeah. I'm not an advocate of small blinds getting or small stacks getting an advantage. I'm a very big proponent of big blind any first uh, before the big blind is posted, uh, which is very, very much against people with short stacks, which is the whole argument in favor of big blind first, not any first. Well, if you don't want to be short stacked, don't be short stacked. Uh, <laughs> play faster or play better. So I'm right. certainly not sympathetic or empathetic to short stack players. That being said, I, I am in favor of what's right. <laughs> and somebody who's paid his obligation, he's earned his action, period. And to take right. it away from him is, is horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Frank, I appreciate you sending that in because it was definitely an interesting one. I, it's, it unfortunate that, it's unfortunate that they got it so egregiously wrong. But, uh, yeah, so next time that it happens – uh, you know, if you're at the table, then um, make sure to, to escalate that to the next level. And uh, if anybody has another call the floor that they would like us to go through, send it to podcast at anyupmagazine.com. Elliot, I appreciate you being here again this week. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. Let's break it down with Hand of the Week. All right, here we are with another Hand of the Week with Patrick. Patrick, how you doing? Joe, I am good, my friend. How are you? I'm good. Hey, before we start, did you look at the Hand of the Week last week? What did you think of those graphics? Did you like oh, that? I got to tell you, I thought I had a big head, and to fit in there, I love the graphics. <laughs> I'm glad you can put my head in there. So, I, uh, you know, this is circa going back to, like, baseball when I was back as a teenager, and I had the biggest head of everyone trying to fit and fit it hatch, so... I'm glad I could fit my big, beautiful <laughs> dome. You could fit it in there. So I loved it. I hope everyone else did because that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing, I got to bring this up. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, as a novice, I, I look at different things on the internet and everything. But have you a couple of things? One, I've got the bad beat of the week. And I don't know if you happen to see this or not, but it was at, it was in the World Series of Poker. Um, and I don't know what specific tournament it was, but. There was a guy, this has got to be one of the worst. A, first, worst calls and worst <laughs> bad beats ever. <laughs> he, flops, he flops quads, jacks, um, and it, but the flop came out nine of hearts, jack of hearts, jack of clubs. I'm literally looking at it right now. And he flops quads. At some, I am assuming he goes all in or got pushed all in. But the other guy had ten of hearts, ten of clubs. So he's got two pair of tens and jacks, and for some stupid reason calls. But then to run it out, he goes queen of hearts, eight of hearts for a straight flush to kick the other guy out all in for quads. Bad oh, my God. <laughs> I might pull a Scott me and pout on the Andy Up show and come up and find these bad beats of the week because that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's bad. Uh, so the flop was – the flop was – Jack of hearts, jack of clubs. What was the other one? Not of hearts. So the other guy literally hearts. had yeah. a not, you know, he's got two tens, two jacks. He's got nine, ten jack of hearts. He literally only has one card of an ultimate, ultimately what it turns into a straight flush. And he, for some reason, calls. Wow. Ooh. I mean, that's when you kind of that... go into a corner and cry. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, that's a problem with, I say problem. That's one of the, the big, things that you have to get through with these giant fields, right? Whenever yeah. you have these giant fields, you have to fade a lot of bad calls like that. I mean, that one's extreme, obviously, but but when there are bad calls like that, then, um, I mean, there's nothing you can do. You just got to yeah. fade those in order to win the big money. But that, but then that money up at the top is, is – it's good money. So yeah, that was like that other one that you and I were mentioning. Um, it was like I want to say it was like twenty, it was twenty plus thousand, like twenty three thousand entries. Um, and I don't know how many unique players it was like around ten thousand, but the first place for a three hundred dollar buy in, original three hundred dollar buy in, 
was half a million dollars. But I mean, yeah. I don't know how long that tournament last. I, I mean, how long it ended up lasting or whatever. But you, talk about fading some things. I mean, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. You could play a perfect tournament and still be in a bad place at a bad time and catch something crazy and not make it in. Oh. Assuming. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that tournament goes on for multiple day ones. And then, you know, you've got day two and day three at least. Uh, I don't remember how many days it ended up being, but you know, there's those fields are ginormous, and then, yeah. and then to have something like that happen, that's rough. <laughs> that would be a bad one. <laughs> We're not playing a tournament this week. We've got uh, some cash. We're gonna play one three. Okay. Um, we're eight handed, and our stack is the effect effective stack with uh, five hundred. Okay. So we're going to just jump in with the under the gun and middle position, both limp for $3. Okay. We're in the low jack with the ace of hearts, king of clubs. Ace of hearts, king of clubs in the low jack position. All right. So what are you going to do with two limpers before you? Uh, well, ace king, I'm going to push a little bit. Um. <laughs> I'm probably going to go um, – Wait, are we going to have two weeks in a row where you raised preflop? Yes, I am. And let me tell you, I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's finally getting to me a little bit. Maybe we're – hey, you know, maybe we were learning this thing, you know, as we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, ace-king against limp to me. I can kind of steal back a little bit of the, I guess, um, how I'm going to run things. So one, three. I'm going to go with um, – I'm going to go with nine. I'm going to do a nine. Okay. Is that too All right. much? So, so here's the thing. We've got you to where you're raising now. That's good. We've got to work on your bet sizing a little bit because that's <laughs> that's not that's not really enough. Um, ah, you've got okay. two. Ah. <laughs> you've got two limpers. So you're really just going three times the big blind, right? But yeah. you've got two limpers, so I would say you want to go at least 15. Uh, I would probably go a little bit more than that, like 18. Okay. And our – oh, you know what? I didn't even say who sent this in. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> awful of me. We just got go. We just got uh, right into this one. Who did send this? I know. Um, yeah, so this, this hand of the week is sent in by Roger Forrest. Sorry, oh, Roger. I'm sorry oh. I didn't mention that ahead of time, but – Sent in by Roger Forrest, and Roger raised to 20. So he went a little bit above yeah. what I even said, but I think that's a fine fine raise there. Okay. The button calls. Okay. Under the gun calls, but the middle position folds. So we've right. got three to a flop. Okay. So we've got, what, 63 in the pot. Yep. The flop comes... The ace of clubs, eight of spades, four of diamonds. All right. Ace of clubs, eight of spades, four of diamonds. Yep. So pretty much a rainbow flop. You've yep. got top pair, top kicker, under the gun checks, and it's up to you. Yeah, we're pushing this again. So working on sizing. So original bet was 20 from Roger. Pot, you said it was 63, right? If I'm doing the math right? Yeah. So top, I flop top pair with it like that. I'm probably pushing at least half the pots, if not more. But I'm probably going to go – I'm going to go over that. I'm going to go like – call it 33 probably. 33. Yeah. 33. Okay. 33. I can see that. Um, I probably would have been right around half pot, so you went a little bit above that, which is good. And Roger bets twenty. Okay, his original bet. So he went, he went, which ends up being what third, third pot, third right? Third pot, yep. Um, the button calls under the gun calls, okay. so we're, we're right where we started, right? And now we've got about um, what one hundred and twenty-three. Yeah, one twenty-three. And the turn is the nine of hearts. Under the gun checks again. 
Now what? None of the gun sounds like the original Patrick Guzzi that started doing this. <laughs> check, check, check. Um, all right, so not of hearts comes out, so we've got um, ace of clubs, eight of spades, four of diamonds, nine of hearts. Still nothing out there that scares me. We've still got top pair. I mean, pot's gotten decently big. We've gone 20, 40. I'm probably pushing again close to half the pot again, or maybe just a little bit less, but I'm probably going – I'm probably doing – I'm probably betting 60. And we still have top pair. Okay. I'm not really yeah, worried about anything flat, else yeah. out there. Um, so that's where I'm going. Roger, yeah, I think half pot, that's not bad. Roger bet 40 here, okay. <laughs> which I have a real problem with that bet, but – he definitely needs to size up there. 40 is not nearly enough. The button calls and under the gun folds. Okay. So under the gun really had nothing is what we have determined here. Yeah, he just <laughs> as as I've done many times, both in hand of the week and in real life with with you, I wasted some money just to keep on playing for no reason. <laughs> 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 so that gives us what 203 in the pot now to yep. something yep. like that and the river is the jack of spades so pretty much a complete rainbow board yep. you still got uh just one pair top pair top kicker right i mean at this point the only reason i mean the only thing that i can make the button on is that He's got eights in hand or fours in hand that he's still betting with me and continuing going, right? He's not waiting for a straight. He's not waiting for a flush. I mean, I guess, is that my only fear? Am I missing anything else? I mean, a couple of the straights got there, but eight, nine, not oh, yeah, one. Right. So what, queen 10 got queen there. 10 gets there. And what seven, else, 10, ten gets seven? Yeah. yeah. But that's really it. Neither one of those sound – Queen-10 on the button, eh. Um, I still – that would have been a, that would have been a pretty big chase on the flop. 10-7 doesn't make a lot of sense either. So – Either that or after the flop. I mean, maybe, maybe he's got another ace. You know, he's got two pair, ace-8, ace-4. Something on the flop that he doubled up. I mean, paired up. So absolutely, yeah. What? So it's two. So under the gun was out after that. So it's actions to me, so, correct? That is correct. Yep. All right. So two of three in the pot. You know, again, I'm probably pushing. It's probably going to be at least. This is probably going to be low for you, but I'm probably somewhere in that. I don't know, seventy-five or eighty bet. You know, a little less than half the pot. No, you know, I I don't see a big problem with that. I I'm I, I like to push a little bit more than that, but in this case, I think that a small bet you could get away with and see what they do with that. That was believe it or not, that was actually my thought. Was like, what if you know, if you go small enough to where you leave room for them to come over the top, then you kind of yeah, that was that was a thought. Yeah, that my only concern, and this is where you, what you have to weigh with things like that is, you have to say, okay, if I if I give them room to come over the top, are they going to see that as weakness and therefore come over the top? Yeah. Or if if I just make my normal bet and they come over the top, then I lost more money, right? So you have to kind of weigh weigh the two options there, and the only way to get that information is to have played with them before true you know for for some time and we don't have that luxury so i don't i don't i definitely don't have a problem with what you're doing there with a smallish bet and see what they do roger ends up checking button checks and um he shows his ace king and the button mucks nice. so he just tosses cards away we win it's a good hand to win later Later, he said he had 10-8, meaning about like what you said, he flopped middle pair and didn't improve, right? Yeah, it never improved on anything. Couldn't make a straight anything like that, so. 
other than coming in low, played decently well that hand. Yeah, I the the turn the turn bet is not great. Yeah. Definitely size up there. Okay. If he sizes up on the turn, he probably the the eight probably folds anyway. But you're also getting out some of those some of those draws. You know, if they have a gut shot of some kind, then you can get them to fold out. Something like that. But uh, other than that turn bet being so small, I think they played decent. Uh, yeah. You could you could make a a case for checking on the the river. I like uh, I like the small to half size pot bet better but yeah i think so okay. and then if they if they end up check raising that's where the question is do you fold at that point i probably do yeah you probably you probably make them on two pair or you know maybe um like the you know ace eight ace four something like that yeah so that's uh not too bad roger <laughs> no, I think Congratulations! All in all, all in all, that's a good takedown bet. I'm sure he's yeah. uh, well on his way to having a very good night that night. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Roger, I pre- uh, appreciate you sending that in as well. And if anyone has a hand of the week that they would like Patrick and I to break down, send it to podcast at anyupmagazine.com, and we'll talk next week, Patrick. Sounds good. Next week, Joe, I will. Uh, my backdrop will not be here in my office. Uh, I will be in sunny Ocean Isle Beach, North Carolina. So I will either have the ocean in my background or the intercoastal waterway as we chat. Please have the ocean in your backdrop. I want to, <laughs> I, I want to live vicariously through you. That we can do. We can <laughs> let, every, let everyone in a little bit. So sounds good. Well, you guys have a great week, and we will chat with you then. The question is... How you running? All right. This week, I'm joined by Danielle Stryker, who I met as a result of the Where Are They Now segment that I did with Tom McAvoy. And uh, Daniel, before we get too far, the first question is always how you running. I'm running really good right now. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, because you know, you, there are times when you just are running like God and you feel like you're literally hitting everything in the deck and your card reading is going well. And so I'm running good in poker, but I'm also running really good in life, which is, you know, not more important, <laughs> even more important. So all good. Yeah. Running really good right now. Yeah. Time to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we picked a good time to do this. Yeah, <laughs> Well, like I said, Danielle and I met through Tom McAvoy, and we started talking about Poker Samadhi, uh, and we ended up we ended up talking for a long time about all things poker and life. And uh, I, eventually, I was like, I, "Hold on, we've got to get you on the podcast, and we got to talk about some of this stuff on here." So uh, let's start with let's start with the book. And okay. and then we'll kind of get into the website and we'll talk about the mantras and stuff like that. But but let's start with the book. When did you write the book? I you know it took a really long time to write, and I'll back channel and tell you that in a second. But I it was uh, published in 2015, um, and it's on Amazon, and it's called Poker Samadhi. Um, and people are always always ask me what does Samadhi mean. I just got asked this yesterday at the poker table, and it means a divine state of consciousness. It's when you're in the zone. Uh, because, you know, I, 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 we kind of talked about this previously, but I studied a lot about human potential and, you know, poker wisdom and life wisdom. And that's a culmination of what the book is. So that's, that's really what, you know, what the book is about. It's a lot of this, what happened was I read like 400 plus books on poker over a very long period of time and, you know, met Tom McAvoy. Obviously he was my very first coach. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, yeah, great person, great man, super high integrity, and just taught me a lot about poker. And he had a lot of poker wisdom himself. And hence, we became very good friends. And so I wound up writing the book because what happened was, Joe, I was taking all of these notes down from 
all of the great players that you know you can imagine. And I was also studying studying with them at the time, like I had studied with Phil Hellmuth, and I had studied with um, just a slew of great players like Joe Hashem and Mark Safe. And, um, oh my God, Daniel Negreanu, um, you know, just Phil Gordon, um, Fossil Man, you know, Greg Raymer. Yeah. And, um, and I had like taken a lot of their wisdom. And what happened was as I was listening to what they were saying about how to play well at poker, it just correlated to life, to how to play well in life. And so what happened was I started taking all this human potential wisdom that I had studied for many, many years as a discipline, right? I'm being present, being focused, being fully aware, you know, and like there's one of the wisdom quotes is you are where your attention is. And so right. same thing in poker, you know, you are where your attention is. You really have to pay attention at the poker table, right? So these are kinds of the things that influence the book. And so all of these I would say these poker mantras is what I really call them are in the book. And so there's, I think I had a thousand plus and the first book is a volume of 108. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you say first book, meaning there's another one coming. Well, yeah, there's actually a whole series of them coming, but let me tell you what happened. So what happened was I would take all these, you know, the input from all of these people and write down all of these like things that I was working on in poker. And I wound up with like a thousand index cards, you know, like play in position, when in doubt, raise, right. you know, re-raise when first in, you know, all of these things like, like that very kind of basic block and tackle. And I would work on them as I was driving to the poker room. And one day I said, there's, why isn't there an app for all of these things that you have to remember? Right. And I'll go back to another famous quote, which is, you know, Buddha says, remember to remember. And I was like, there's no app for this. So I wrote one. So first I wrote an app and there's like 1200 of these poker mantras, these things that you work on over and over again to get yourself in a Samadhi state, you know, very centered at the poker table. So you're ready to right. play. Um, and so I wrote the app, but then the app has to be updated, but I wrote the first volume of the best 108 of those that I, you know, looked to do. And so now I have like 10 volumes that I can write because I have a thousand of these poker mantras. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get volume two done soon here. I've been talking about it forever, but yeah, I think <laughs> that may be more powerful ultimately. So, yeah. Yeah. And then of course, I mean, you've got the website where you have different mantras of different poker pros, right? So yeah. it's kind of what they wanted to pass along. So their own mantra, is that yep. fair to say? It is fair to say, um, yes. <laughs> and then from that, there's actually, you know, there's there's actually merchandise there too, but, you know, each one of them has a mantra that might uh, appeal or f might be your a mantra that you need to follow or whatever, right? Yeah, I mean, the mantras, you know, poker mantras are really used a lot. You know, we all do self-talk to ourselves. So mm -hmm. what, what, what I'm really about is with Poker Samadhi is saying put the right self-talk into your cranium so that you can be confident, so that you feel good, that you're in the right state of mind. The goal is to help poker players take out the noise and get into a, this, you know, into the zone, the Samadhi state. So when they're sitting at the table, the distractions are gone. And like, for example, like Tom McAvoy became, is one of our poker gurus, right? On the website, pokersamadi.com. And Tom, uh, TJ Cloutier also had tremendous amount of wisdom, right? And so you can read about those, but I, oh, I said to Tom, you know, what is your poker mantra? And he said, you know, the most famous thing I ever said is there's more to poker than life. And I didn't really understand that until, <laughs> you know, you say, you know, it's this kind of observe, you know, observance of oneself and of the game and of the things that are going on. And people really do act very, you know, there's another old quote, like, you know, a player's real personality is stripped at the poker table. Like you really see who they are. And so it's this, it's this ability to get present and really observe other players and then observe yourself and use those mantras to get in the zone. I'll, I'll give you another one. Like another one is money saved is money won. That's Tom as well. And it's like, right, okay, great. What does that mean? It means make sure you manage your chip stack. Make sure you're getting it in good. 
Make sure you're playing right, the correct odds, the correct outs. Make sure that you're playing well. So there's a lot of these things. And so here's what happened. Um, my best friend in the entire world said, Danielle, your story and this entire poker mantras and the way you work on poker and how you've transitioned it into your life, which I'll tell you a little about in a minute, is like so powerful. Why don't we get the greatest gurus and then get their wisdom, your wisdom, which you've already been like a conduit for, and right. you know, to create merchandise, right? Like caps and mugs and all those kinds of things. And we have wristbands, you know, to remind you of, to do something. So that's what we did. So like my personal mantra in life is slow down. And you can see right. like I operate at a very high speed, but when I get to the poker table, I have to slow down. And so that mantra permeates my entire game. Right, right. So we've, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I, I want you to, kind of tell the story about the slowdown and how that really kind of came to be more of a um, standard in your life as well. Yeah. So. Okay. So I'm born in New York city. I'm super high energy as you can tell. And everything was always go, go, go. I started my life out as a Broadway dancer. I did three Broadway shows, national tours, and I was always super like, you know, high energy still am. So um, in 1986, I had um, the unfortunate crucible event of having a massive motorcycle accident. And, you know, it doesn't kill you, you know, it always makes you stronger. But in my case, everybody had always been telling me to slow down my whole life. And so <laughs> <laughs> the universe has an interesting way of working. So that event really made me slow down. And it was a really bad accident that I was in. And I had an out-of-body experience, and I got to experience slow down firsthand. And what happened to me in that out-of-body experience was I was, like, propelled over my body, looking at myself and observing just energy. It was like I was in an, an altered state in a pure energy state, and everything slowed down. I mean, and I'm sure other people that have these kinds of experiences, experience something, but it was like my entire life was to get slow down. And in that moment, I got to experience life in an altered dimension. And it was, it was um, really just an observance that we are all energy at the end of the day. And so I came back into my body. My leg is wrapped around the motorcycle handlebars. I get, you know, the helicopter, the ambulance comes. I get helicoptered. They wind up sending me to Lenox Hill in New York City. I'm, in a, I'm now condensing the story. But I literally, for two and a half years, had to slow down. I was in a wheelchair. I had to do PT. I went from, you know, the wheelchair to the walker, you know, to cane, to, you know, crutches to cane. And my entire career was over. I mean, I was a Broadway dancer, singer, actress, and it was over in an instant. And so that two and a half year period of slowing down and that experience, I never had again, okay? Of that kind of like altered state of experiencing one with the universe. And so hence, I'll jump forward 20 plus years and I wind up moving, moving to Las Vegas um, via California, long story. But my husband and I moved <laughs> to Vegas, yeah. And I wound up taking a poker totally. It's almost like, you know, I think a lot of people will say this too. Poker found me. I did not find poker. And poker is really the perfect game to experience, you know, this kind of state. And so what happened is one day uh, a friend of mine invited me to play poker. I wound up playing. Again, I'm condensing the story. They said, you know, you should really learn how to play poker. So I went online and this is back in 2007. And I searched for like poker pro and what popped up was Tom McAvoy. And this was in the day I'm living in Vegas. I've been living here five years, never played a lick of poker, never gambled. And this was in the day when Google would pop up your address and then your phone. <laughs> so I looked at it and I go, Oh, here's a poker pro. And it said author of 14 books and four W S O P. I had no idea what was up was bracelet. <laughs> I'm like, what is a wasp? And then I, I'm reading World Series of Poker. I'm like, I always thought of that as baseball. Anyway, make a long story short, I'm like, 
who could possibly write 14 books on poker, right? Like, what do I know? So I pick up the phone and I call and Tom McAvoy answers and he says, hello, this is Tom. And I say, hello, this is Danielle. I want to learn how to play poker. He goes, great. I'm a poker coach. I said, can I learn from you? And he says, absolutely. When do you want to start? And I said, right now? He said, great, come on over. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> you put yourself in the right place at the right time. It all just happens. Well, it turns out he lived two, um, two blocks from me. So I got in the car and I'll tell you, I was really like, kind of like weirded out. I'm like, is this going to be like dark and seedy, like, you know, like rounders kind of thing, which it wasn't. Right. <laughs> it wasn't at all. He like answered the door in like white shorts and black socks and flip flops. And he said, okay, come upstairs. I'm really, really busy. I'm multi-tabling. And like, you have to realize, I don't understand the thing he's saying. <laughs> so I like followed him upstairs. And this is the beginning of my poker, right? You know, like education. But I get up there and I'm, he goes, he turns everything off. He's done with his games. And he turns to me and he says, okay, tell me your experience in poker. And then I go on this diatribe for like three minutes about, well, I play this game and I really want to learn how to play, you know, tournaments, but I think I want to play cash and I'm blah, 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 and I'm going a hundred miles an hour. And the first thing he says to me is slow down. So I'm yeah. like, Hmm, is the universe trying to tell me something here? So that happens. And then I start studying. And then I realize what an incredibly difficult game a this is. But B, that you have to take in a tremendous amount of knowledge and you really have to slow down to assess, right? Situational poker, what's happening, what is this other player's approach to the game? Basically, there's yeah. so much observation yeah. and you can't observe by going 100 miles an hour. So I literally would have to meditate before I'd go to the poker table, which I've been doing for years breathe and then I would get centered and I'd slow down. And so then one day, many years, like three years into my poker life, I'm sitting at this table playing just a one, two game. And I had meditated and all of a sudden I got into this state that I was very calm. And I had that out of body experience. Like I had when I had the motorcycle accident and I was hovering over the table and it was if everybody had their cards turned over I knew what every hand was and I could tell you every card that was coming on the flop, the turn, the river, I could call the cards. I have a lot of people that can validate this for you. And when I get in that state, right? Like Doyle Brunson called it poker ESP. Phil Helmuth calls it white magic, but this is what it's a, it is. When you get into a state where you are in Samadhi or you are in the zone you are like a vibrational frequency. You are tuned in. And when you can get right. there, that's when the beauty of the game really starts. And also I would say the beauty of your life because people experience when they're in the zone at work or they're in the zone and they're in a samadhi state where they're just working and they look at it's 9 a.m. and then all of a sudden it's 6 p.m. and they didn't eat lunch and they didn't do anything else. But they're so in right. love, right, with that process. And that's, the beauty of poker samadhi. And so that was the experience of having that slow down moment. Yeah. And that's, I was actually just, you, you kind of led me there. I was going to say, you know, a lot of this obviously is, is centered around poker, but a lot of that advice can be translated to life and life to poker. So the, the two kind of go hand in hand to some degree. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of this advice is good for you to take and apply every day, right? Yeah. And that's, that's really what happened to me is because I've been in technology for 20 plus years. And I, I, what happened is I noticed that when I started playing poker and started playing very well and play and also playing from this sort of perspective of enjoying the adventure and the journey and the observation aspect of poker along with winning, obviously, it, it bled into my like business life where I'd be getting ready to go to a meeting and I'd say, wait a minute, who are the players in this meeting? Who has position? <laughs> Who's going to be running the table or running the meeting? What, how do I want to be in the meeting so that I can be present and slow down, but also really start to assess the situation if we're in negotiation, as an example. So I, all this poker 
wisdom, right, was leading into my negotiations. Perfect example is, you know, you always want to be in position when you're negotiating. You always want to be right. able to act. And so when I'm negotiating a business contract, right, I would let the, that person give me all the information and I would query and question and when I'm trying to sell my deal, right? Or I'm trying to sell my hand for the most amount of value. I'm trying to get a deal that's the most amount of value. And so I would let them lay out what they wanted and they basically give you a lot of the information and they'll tell, they will literally tell you the price they want if you ask them sometimes, if they're not a good negotiator. And so then you get all that information. And so I would get that information and I would literally think this this entire meeting is like a poker game, right? So they would make an offer and then I would raise. And I could hear like, you know, Joe Hashem in the back of my head saying, when in doubt, rice, you know? So, <laughs> he's so great. Uh, I got to study with him too at uh, to the WSOP Academy. This is a long time ago, you know? But you can hear, you know, I hear all these voices in my head. I'm not schizophrenic, obviously, but these people are <laughs> I think we all do, right? And so it was hearing mm -hmm. that and saying, wow, well, now they're going to raise back. Oh, well, you know, we don't know. Da, 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 we're going to raise. And I'm like, I'm re-raising. And the thing is, I found that I would, all the skills that I now have in poker about playing a hand and playing with people and managing that that dance, if you will, has bled into being a much better business person as well and being more present slowing the process down, not playing their game, playing my game, getting them to play on my terms, which is a big deal when you're playing at a table, right? So there's yeah. all those synergies, Joe. I mean, it's just the greatest game ever invented. And because it includes chips and money, any business person that doesn't study poker or play poker is really missing out, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I talk about that a lot in my one-outers uh, how much <laughs> the two can be related, but we didn't talk a lot about it, but, but the, tell me again, the website, pokersamadi.com, right? Yes. Is that so, right? Yeah. So every single piece of merchandise, all of the mantras that are on there, you, they're, they're meant to be reminders. Like, you know, our whole slogan is play your best life. That's what we want people to do. So if you go to the website, you'll see Tom McAvoy's you know, a lot of his famous quotes that he said, and you can use them as mantras. Um, I'll give you another one. TJ Cloutier is on there. And so he, he always says the dealer is powerless. But what does that mean? Right. So it has, a, it has a backstory and you can read the backstory and then you'll understand so that you don't go on tilt when the dealer doesn't deal you your one outer or the one outer, <laughs> right? hits your opponent. You're not angry at the dealer. And here's the backstory. So and I'll make it short, but, you know, TJ was in the World Series, the final table with Chris Ferguson. And he basically had the hand made. You can read the story. But at the end, that one outer, two outer was hit to beat him for millions of dollars. It was $1.5 million. And he was stoic. He didn't even, he did not react. He chose to respond. He didn't do anything. He shook Chris's hand and that dealer dealt out, right? That card that was brutal that also robbed him of the WSOP bracelet, the main event. Now, this is someone who's played a very, very long time <laughs> and <is> a pure <laughs> professional. So when he walked away from the table, I guess there was an interview off site and they said, oh, you know, aren't you so upset with the dealer and the dealer dealt that card? And I mean, you know, that was the worst bad beat ever we've ever seen at a final table. And he basically really calmly looked at the interviewer and said, the dealer's powerless, you know? And so I took that as, and I've spoken to him about this, you know, this is life. Life is going to deal you a hand. It's going to deal you cards. It's going to deal, you know, your, your opponent, that one outer on the river. And it's up to you how you respond not how you react. Right. And so that to me, the dealer is powerless. It's a reminder of life's going to happen. You are always in control of how you respond to the circumstances. So that's right. what the site's about. And that's what the business is about. And that we're here to elevate and help people play their best life, whether it's a poker table or in the business world. 
<laughs> That's the perfect ending spot right there. And I, the problem is I could probably talk to you forever <laughs> about all of these things, but but we've got to end it somewhere, and I think that's a good stopping point. Maybe we'll have you on again another time, and we'll talk some more about some of these other things because there's so many things to touch on. But, uh, Daniel, I really appreciate you joining me this week, and um, we'll talk again for sure. Sounds good. Well, have a great day, and play your best life. <laughs> it's time for Joe's One out of Responding to adversity. We just talked about it with Danielle in the How You Run In segment. How you respond to adversity is key to your future success in the game. And when I say adversity, I mean things like bad beats, losing streaks, or even very difficult decisions. Letting frustration or anger take over in those situations can lead to impulsive and irrational decisions. Remember, Poker is a game of highs and lows. Something as simple as understanding that variance is a natural part of the game can help you maintain a level head. Because adversity in the short term does not necessarily indicate a flaw in your abilities. Focus on making consistently good decisions over the long term. And if you do make a mistake, and you will, learn from it then move on. Just remember, it's an inevitable part of the game. How you respond to difficult situations will greatly influence your overall performance. And when you learn to handle the ups and downs in poker, you certainly will have a lot more fun. That's today's one outer and that's today's show. I'll see you next week, A-Team. And until then, I'll see you at the tables. The Any Up Podcast is a production of AnyUpMagazine.com. Contact the show at podcast at AnyUpMagazine.com or call the show at 540-339-7741. If you'd like to advertise, send an email to editor at AnyUpMagazine.com. <laughs>